Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Illusion of Consensus podcast with myself, Rav Arora, independent journalist, and Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, a professor at Stanford University. Um, it's really good to see you, Jay. It's been it's been a while, uh, but I'm glad to uh, get together again. It's really good to catch up with you, Rav. Uh, it has been a while. I, I think you've you've been on on a nice, fun trip, if I understand correctly. Yeah, I was gone to Europe for for a month. Did uh, Switzerland, Italy, France, Spain. Uh, it was really the first kind of vacation that I took since I uh, um, started journalism in like 2020. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun. It was nice to take time off and uh, visit the Tower of Pisa, have lots of pizza and pasta and and all of it. So it was it was a lot of fun. That sounds like uh, I I took a, tr- a similar trip in my twenties, uh, early twenties. Also, it was really fun. I, I remember mm. it very fondly, but I also remember being very tired when I got back. <laughs> yeah, I was very tired. I was I needed a vacation from the vacation. It was just thirty days of just nonstop, just too too, too much going on, seeing too many things, trying all the wines, all the foods, all the ch- just way too. It's just like all right, I just want to be home and just like <laughs> eat some simple food and relax and just sleep for once instead of doing all the fun stuff. But I, I'm I'm glad to be back. Uh, both of us have been kind of back. Uh, you were also on a, uh, on a bit of a trip. Well, I've been on lots of trips. I've been, uh, tr- giving talks basically, um, it seems like everywhere. Uh, so it is, yeah. but it's, it's been fun to, I finally have had a couple of weeks at home, which has been good to start, try to catch up on things. I've really been looking forward to catching up with you because there's so much has gone on in the last several weeks. Uh, there, there was a Supreme court case, there was the the the, the hope accords that which we t- I mean there was a you know I did this podcast on the uh, on the illusion of consensus podcast with uh, with Joe Freeman about it uh, yep. and, uh, the, you know there a whole bunch of events to catch up on so I was really looking forward to catching up with you I'm glad we had this chance yeah yeah I've uh, been missing it and uh, I think uh, we're going to do it more and more often um, and yeah the, lot, lots to talk about and I, I a few people had messaged. Say we we need Rav and Jay back together to to talk about things. So I was like, we're going to make it happen as soon as we're uh, we're off a of vacation and you know back into the swing of things. And it, it's since I came back from Europe, I've just been just slammed with so much going on. Like just the news cycle just won't stop. Obviously, with the attempted assassination of Trump and Biden and Kamala Harris and uh, all the stuff with Israel, Gaza. Like there's just so much going on in the news cycle, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, to chatting about some of the things that are uh, relevant to our podcast. Fantastic. Well, why don't we let's get let's get to it? Yeah. So let's uh, start with the uh, Murphy v. Missouri case. Um, so the Supreme Court decision came uh, a few weeks ago. Now, you did a podcast with Janine Jonas already. That's on our uh, YouTube channel. Oh, people can go check it out and Spotify and Apple. Um, but uh, I think it's important to dig deeper on it. I know we're going to do more coverage. You also have a podcast coming up with uh, Aaron Cariotti, which I uh, teased on our Substack as well. Uh, but let's open with that. Like, I feel like a lot of people are are curious to to know more about it. Some people are confused. I was definitely confused when I first saw it because of the um, uh, legal implications and some, some of the technical points with it. But let, let's just spend a few minutes uh, going into that and uh, giving us your reaction. And then obviously when you do the podcast with Aaron uh, next week or the week after, uh, we'll, you'll do a, a deeper dive so people can also uh, yeah, so, tune so, in for that. I mean, just to, just to briefly recap of the case. The case uh, was brought in 2022 by the Missouri uh, and Louisiana Attorney General's Office, alleging that the Biden administration had censored, uh, basically forced social media companies to censor people online that made posts uh, that that they, they didn't like, uh, including me, Martin Kuldorf, uh, Jill Hines, of uh, uh, Aaron Cariotti, and others. Um, the uh, the case resulted in us having discovery where we saw emails th- from the Biden administration, hot, the White House, the CDC. Uh, the Surgeon General's office, you name it, essentially directly threatening social media companies saying, like, and sometimes implied threats saying, look, if you don't censor these people and these ideas, uh, we're going to go after you. That led a, a court in uh, the Fifth Circuit, Federal Court, Fifth Circuit, uh, uh, to issue an injunction, a preliminary injunction on July 4th of 2023 saying that, look, uh, you're not allowed to do this to the Biden administration. You're not allowed to censor that violates the First Amendment. These folks who brought this case are likely to win the case. It's really hard to actually get a preliminary injunction. In, normally, you'd have to prove your case and have a full trial. The, the judge was signaling very strongly that the, the evidence we'd already developed up to date was so strong that it was very clear that we were suffering a First Amendment harm. 
And of course, it wasn't just us. The, the reason we brought the case was because it's literally millions and millions and millions of people that were censored by these activities, including vaccine injured people who on Facebook would form groups um, and they would post true statements and the, and the Biden administration would force Facebook to take those posts down, uh, to, to shut down those groups. Which, um, which I remember, like, I remember this interview with Mark, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Lex Friedman, where he admitted that a lot of posts that were taken down often had true information. Yeah, it didn't matter if it was true. All that mattered was that it, it contradicted the, stra- the, the priorities of the Biden administration, right? So this is what led the federal judge in July 4th, 2023, to issue that preliminary injunction. The Biden administration appealed to the, to the appeals court in Fifth Circuit, who then affirmed that injunction, narrowed it a little bit, but basically said, yeah, there really has been a major violation of First Amendment rights. The, the Biden administration it should be forced to stop doing it. That went up to the Supreme Court, and that, uh, I mean, it was the, the oral arguments were heard in March of this year, March of 2024. And in June, uh, the Supreme Court came back with a technical decision saying that the, the litigants in the case, the plaintiffs in the case, me, uh, Martin Kuldorf, um, you know, Aaron Cariotti, Jill Hines, and others, did not have standing. They explicitly said that, that it was a six to three decision. The, the, um, the people that dissented, they said, look, this is a direct violation of the First Amendment. These people's rights have been violated. Uh, the, they absolutely should not, the Biden administration absolutely should not be allowed to continue to do that. That, that was the minority. The majority said we didn't have standing. Standing means that uh, it's it's a it's kind of a principle that the Supreme Court sometimes puts it to, but has in place to say, look, you need to have some cause to sue. It can't just be anyone who has some random person in, enforcing a law. You have to have some cause to sue. But the the standard they used was so strict that essentially means that uh, that almost nobody could have standing. Um, but now I, let me, I'm going to amend that in a second. Cause I, there's, there's some been update to the case in the last uh, couple of weeks or so that are really important, but I want to just spend one minute on this standing thing. Essentially what they were asking for, what the Supreme Court asking for was an, a set of emails from the Biden administration to social media companies saying, censor Jay, censor Martin, censor Aaron. And if you don't have that string of emails alongside with a threat that says, look, if you don't, we're going to go after you. And then the, and then the, the Facebook or whatever c- coming back and saying, look, um, uh, we w- weren't going to do this, but we will do this. We'll censor Jay because you're asking us to do it. Right? They're essentially they're asking for that kind of string of emails. Um, it, it, they, and if you don't have that string of emails, the majority of the Supreme Court was saying, that you don't have standing. Think about that. You're censored by the Biden administration, by, the, by some government, by the government, and you have no idea that you've been censored. You don't have access to those emails. The court essentially is going to deny you standing uh, to sue and, and, and actually look and get those emails. Unless some some freak circumstance, you're never going to know you're censored. If that So essentially what the Supreme Court was saying was that the First Amendment is unenforceable. That anyone um, that, the, that, the, that the government could, as long as they don't name a single individual or set of individuals and have that train of emails, that they could they could go to social media companies and say censor these ideas, right? If anyone says there's immunity after COVID recovery, anyone says there exists vaccines vaccine injuries for COVID um, vaccines, anyone that says that the lockdowns are harmful, you should censor them or else. Well, no one's going to have standing. They'll just they'll censor me. They'll censor you. And because they didn't name us explicitly in the chain of emails, then the uh, under the, the doctrine that Supreme Court has essentially established, no one has standing to sue. Mm. But 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 you were blacklisted though, right? On Twitter, I was. But there's not an email from the government that says to, to Twitter blacklist Jay. Right. There's just a set of emails that say people are people are spreading misinformation on these topics, immunity vaccine injury, whether kids should have the vaccine, whatever. Um, and then that's it. That That's enough that, that you know, I get, I get blacklisted as a result. Um, so, so it's, um, it's sort of a, it's sort of a, uh, I mean, I think they did it mainly to sort of punt on the issue, right? And it's a very important election issue, right? So will the administration be able to censor people about election, uh, you know, election fraud claims or whatever it is, right? Um, and I think the Supreme Court didn't want to enter in this issue, but they also didn't want to say uh, they also didn't want to say that it was okay that the that to violate the First Amendment. So they were they were, they thought they were essentially punting on a technical point 
But in fact, there's a substantive impact to that technical point, which is that so, someone has to show that chain of emails. And it's an impossible thing to do, essentially, for most vast right. majority of people. Yeah. Are there any emails w- which have specifics? Like, I know there are some emails for Berenson v. Biden, right? Where specifically it's about Alex. Uh, are there yeah. other emails too with other prominent individuals? Yes, there are. In fact, I think even in our case, there were emails explicitly naming Jill Hines. So I, I'm not, I don't, I don't really understand. I mean, the, the, understand how they sort of ignored those. The, the majority actually said they didn't read the evidentiary record very carefully in the case. Oh. I mean, they explicitly say that in a footnote. So, I, I, whereas the the minority made a big deal, the, the three judges that voted in our favor made a big deal out of out of Jill Hines being explicitly named. Mm. Um, but uh, here's the here's what's happened in the case in the last couple of weeks. Um, so there are two other cases that are going through the courts that are similar to ours. There's the Berenson case that you just mentioned against Biden. In that case, Alex uh, showed that there were administration officials that explicitly went after him, asking Twitter to take him down with by name, right? Um, and the other one is RFK Jr. has a case he uh, with a very, very similar set of facts to ours, where, again, there are, there are explicit demands that RFK Jr. be taken down by and restricted his his reach restricted his his post restricted um both now rfk jr asked to be joined to our case the missouri re biden case um that happened before right before just before the case went to the supreme court so when the supreme court heard the case he wasn't joined to our case but he is but he is now he's asked to be joined he has been joined and there's this principle that if only one of the people that have standing um, are found to have standing, then everyone has standing in the case. Mm. So it, the case now goes back down to the lower court where we're going to have a chance to prove standing. And RFK Jr. has joined the case. He has standing. They're going oh, to have to... He's cons- joined your case. He has joined our case. And so now he's going to... Ha- they're going to have to decide what they're going to do with that. I mean, if they if they decide that he has standing, and of course, Supreme Court didn't decide on him, Um then that means the entire case goes through still. That the preliminary injunction should go through just like it had before on July 4th of last year. Um, that's I'm very hopeful, actually, now. We might see some movement in the case where because RFK Jr. is joined, because this other case with Alex, Alex Berenson is going, that someone will have standing in the case and we will get an, a, an injunction. Mm-hmm. Um, also, and the case itself will get heard. Like we're gonna, It's going to take a, a year or some, uh, but it's going to get heard. We're going to get heard in the lower court. Um, I have to say, even if we win the case, though, Rav, I'm still worried because if it's required that you have to have this kind of standing, then it's going to be very difficult for future enforcement of the First Amendment. Uh, There really needs to be a law that says, look, anybody who's been censored in this way can ask to see whether the government requested that kind of censorship or requested this kind of censorship of ideas to to led to people being censored. That should be transparency about this, a law that says the government should not be allowed to request that ideas, legal ideas, be censored on the internet. Hmm. And uh, I know Tom Massey has a bill uh, that, that's been introduced in the House. We'll see what happens. But I think this this is a major, to me, a major political issue. Um, and if the Supreme Court's going to have this standing requirement, well, the court, the the Congress can come in and, and put and put in a law that says no, you don't need standing. You just you, you, there should be radical transparency and a restriction on the ability of the of the administration to to use its power to bully around social media companies in in the service of censoring legal speech. Mm. Uh, two things: um, wouldn't wouldn't everyone get standing because Jill Hines has standing because there were emails specifically about her, and then and secondly, yeah. I was going to bring up the point about you know people who would argue in in the other direction would say well what about national security threats and you know should the government should have power to go to social media companies and say hey there's this nuclear conflict going on we don't want this information going out etc cetera, etc cetera. sure so uh, on uh, on Jill's uh, the 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 minority actually looked very carefully at the evidentiary record and they concluded that Jill Hines did have standing um the uh majority essentially said that they didn't look carefully at the evidentiary record I mean, in my opinion, Jill definitely had standing. There's no question, even by the, the standard that the Supreme Court used for standing, which is that, look, you have to show this chain of email. I mean, there's emails explicitly naming her. Um, so I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I think uh, the Supreme Court erred on that, made a mistake on that in 
rejecting her standing. But I think the bigger error is requiring that kind of state proof of standing to begin with. Um, I, I think we will get a, a finding of standing for RFK Jr. I mean, he's one of these people that they explicitly named in uh, a, a, to take down. Oh, they did. The Surgeon General's office did that, did. right? So, did. okay. Um, so, yeah. So I think I don't. I don't. I th- I'm not. I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not. As long as like we get a fair hearing, which I think we will in the lower courts, um, they're going to find that at least one of us had standing. I'm much more worried about the requirement of standing at all. Like we should. We shouldn't need to have that. And on your second question, another excellent question, Raf. On, on national security issues, it's not legal speech to leak classified information right mm-hmm. that's protected speech the government has a right to protect classified information and so it's not as if um some they can that that you know that if, if someone is leaking classified information that's a criminal offense as we saw with julian assange for instance although in, in this case he was he wasn't like privy to the, leak, the to the to the leak he was a journalist reporting and i think it's quite unfair what happened to him but the point is that the, the government has recourse and the kind of standards you would apply to classified information uh, should not be brought to bear on speech just more generally and i think as a as a matter of like free speech rights if you were to apply those kinds of national security ideas to uh, regular speech, there's just no such nothing left to free speech, right? The government could always just say, uh, "You're you're you're harming uh, you're harming like public health, you're harming whatever," and and uh, and stop you from speaking uh, right. with absolutely no recourse. Yeah. So you think short of calls to violence, that's where a lot of free speech advocates that that's where they draw the line. Short of that, there should not be any restriction on anything as sensitive or as difficult or as m- m- misinformation laden it might be. Well, I don't think, I think, uh, yeah, I think like, obviously, I think I agree that calls to violence should not be permitted. I mean, that's something you can, but of course, that's adjudicated after someone's made the call. You don't, you don't have a, a, a prior restriction on speech. Um, but, you know, violent threats, uh, calls for insurrection, calls for assassination, all those are, are not legal speech, I, don't, I, I think. Um, and uh, as is, you know, defamation is not legal speech, but there, the recourse for that is, you know, uh, 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 to, is is law is our laws against defamation, against slander and libel, or, or whatnot. Um, the the recourse to uh, to leaking classified information is criminal criminal charges against the, the person who leaked the information, right? It's it's not prior restraint on speech. Uh, so I'm not saying you know child porn should be restricted by. I mean, and, and of course the the uh, the uh, the sites themselves have. Have their, their, their private sites they can they can make their own rules um and so like you know you can have something like threads where it's like you know people hold hands and say kumbaya and that's all the speech that's allowed um but uh but 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 allow on twitter it, it's it's much more freewheeling and i think that's that's good as long as it's focused on legal speech i have no problem with that um illegal speech i mean of course there should be rules against that and and, and the sites themselves have res- uh, the responsibility to do that because they don't want to be tagged as places where illegal speech is happening okay um and the dissenting opinion um so it was three justices um can you remind me were those all trump appointed or uh do, no, do you know uh, i mean they're the republican appointed but i don't think trump appointed so tom uh, thomas justice thomas uh there was uh, justice alito and justice gorsuch gorsuch was the three okay that ruled in our favor yeah and they're they're republican nominated yeah three of them were i mean yeah. you know six of the six of the nine are republican nominated i think so right and on I mean, the in principle they're supposed to rule on the law not on the not yeah. on the uh on the uh you know sort of political <laughs> yeah in any case i don't i don't see how um I mean, free speech is a bipartisan issue. It's not a, it's not a, yeah. you know, right wing or left wing thing. I mean, both left, right and left have an interest in in promoting free speech rights. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was watching uh, Glenn Greenwald's coverage of the case, which is pretty fascinating. And I, I forget which case it was. I think it might have been related to NSA and uh, um, inve- uh, surveilling citizens without warrants. And in that particular case, it was um, there was a lot of uh, conservative support for censorship and it seemed i think uh, what he was saying was the justices that were uh, republican nominated were in favor of it and the dissenting judges were democrat appointed now we've seen like an interesting ideological shift where free speech is oddly associated with with people on the right when it really should be sort of transpartisan it shouldn't it doesn't matter whether you're left or right this should 
it, it, like really it's not about ideology it's about can you actually say what you believe without the threat of censorship yeah i mean it's it's a very strange historical moment where you actually um you're right ravel what you're seeing is uh, support on the left for these kinds of restrictions. Uh, they, there's a uh, there was a hypothetical brought up by uh, Justice Kentaji Jackson in the oral arguments. It was really really weird to me. Uh, what she argued was that uh, she gave a hypothetical where there's a social media fad of kids jumping out of windows. They film themselves jumping out of windows, daring kids to jump out of higher and higher windows. And she asked, well, shouldn't the government have the right to restrict that the social media posting those things? And, you know, it's funny uh, because what happened during the pandemic was that the government harmed kids by closing schools and then censored the people that were criticizing the government that might have prevented kids being harmed. It cuts both ways, right? And so, and like, in fact, when there is a fad like that, the social media companies themselves have a responsibility, even without any government action, to try to like res- to, to 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 make sure that those those kinds of like dares don't d- dangerous dares don't spread. Um, you know, and all, all of them have some some suppression of those kinds of things to begin with. It's not like uh, you know, Facebook is very happy. To, I mean, I saw Mark Zuckerberg apologize to kids who had committed suicide in, fr- in front of Congress um, because of uh, apparently because they were looking at Facebook things and and uh, and and like. Uh, you know, sort of had a psychological effect on them. I think the it's a complicated issue. The platforms themselves have responsibilities. Parents, of course, have responsibilities. Um, the government, if we take Kentucky Jackson's um, sort of uh, hypothetical to the extreme, essentially can use that to to suppress criticism of itself, which I think in the long run causes much more harm than than good. Uh, I don't think the solution to to the, those kinds of threats is suppression of speech. The, the solution is, from the government perspective, is to maintain credibility so that people trust you when they when you say jumping out of windows is bad. So we had a couple of uh, interesting listener questions that I wanted to get to. Um, well, we had quite a bit uh, when I put out the call out for your uh, conversation with uh, Aaron, which is going to be a deeper dive into this. Um, we, we received quite a few interesting questions. I decided to pick two and then the rest, um, you can go through in the, in the conversation with Aaron. So one is from, uh, William K and he says that as the opinion seemed to indicate that even assuming coercion by the government, plaintiffs did not have standing as they could not show evidence. They were in some legal sense harmed. But what about all the social media users who were deprived of reading what the plaintiffs wrote? on social media due to the government's ongoing coercion aren't millions harmed simply by being deprived from hearing arguments and facts that dissent from the government narrative. Isn't that the real harm? So uh, a couple of points on that. Um, So first a narrow point. So uh, it's interesting because in the majority opinion, there's this like throwaway line that, that suggests that if we had been asking for money for damages, then I mean, there's this hint that maybe we would have had standing, but because we are not asking for money, there's no future harm to us because the the, the you know administration has sworn up and down they're no longer censoring us, so therefore we don't have standing. I mean, it's just a funny thing. Like I'm not in the case for money. I'm in the case because I want to help restore free speech rights in this country. Right? I, I I don't want to benefit financially from this case. Uh, so I've not. That's why we didn't ask for money. Um, the uh, the broader point though is is the reader is absolutely 100 percent right. Right, it's not just me that was harmed by my speech being censored. It's it's people who follow me, listen to me. I'm harmed by other people being censored. The public space, public the public square needs us to be able to speak to each other. And what that means is that there's going to be wrong ideas out there. There's going to be right ideas out there, and they clash with each other. The idea that the government somehow can tell the difference between true and false unerringly and only suppress true. Without ever using its power to 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 like to to do to essentially put forward falsehoods, it's incredibly naive. Um, the The problem with the Supreme Court ruling is that they are essentially saying that none of those millions of people that were deprived of that of hearing that speech have standing. Um, and so, I think the First Amendment. I I mean, I, I don't want to be hyperbolic, but it really, I think, at this point, the First Amendment. As it currently stands under Supreme Court doctrine, is essentially dead as, as as a dead letter. It's an unenforceable dead letter. The government can go censor speech sen- in the form of ideas as long as they no- name an individual, and nobody has standing to sue or enforce the F- First Amendment. 
And do you think uh, COVID was the big precedent for that? Or, or prior to that, there were also concerns as well on issues like the transgender debate and how certain voices were censored in that discussion as well? I, I haven't seen any evidence on the transgender debate where you I saw uh, emails from governments asked, telling social media to censor. Yeah, yeah. But, but I have seen, I mean, I mean, it's possible I missed something, but I did see uh, a lot of evidence on election integrity. Right, so the government yeah. in 2020 used its power to censor social media discussions about, you know, claims about uh, stolen elections, uh, fraud, voter fraud, whatnot. Um, that was a major focus of the censorship complex in 2020. All right, second question by Ken Ken Peterson: What is the difference between lack of standing to get a preliminary injunction and lack of standing to file the suit? Seems the suit with the current plaintiffs continues to continue so the lack of standing was only for the injunction purpose uh that's another great question by readers uh, c- clearly readers are following along the case uh, very very closely um the, the uh so because it's this preliminary injunction normally there's higher standards for a preliminary injunction to win than uh than, it, than there is for the, the case at large you're basically asking the court to do something extraordinary to say you're going to win and therefore we tell it telling the defendant to stop doing something that'll harm the, the plaintiffs right so stop censoring people, right? That's the preliminary injunction, even before the case has finally concluded and con- that, uh, that the Biden administration actually was guilty of this. Um, so it's an extraordinary, it's usually a higher standard. I-, I have to say, I don't think there's a major difference between the standing requirement, at least as I understand what the Supreme Court has done, um, and uh, uh, for a preliminary injunction and for the case at large. I think that you're going to have basically the same standards applied for both. Um, and now I could be wrong. There are lawyers uh, who, who have, do I respect to think that there is a distinction and I'm certainly not a lawyer. And I, and in fact, I hope I'm wrong because if the standard as a, is applied to the current plaintiffs in the case, Supreme court has already ruled on that. We don't have standing. Um, I do think that ju- when, uh, having RFK junior join the case that gives the lower court and even the Supreme court a, an excuse to find that we do have standing, right? Again, you only need one plaintiff to have standing to have the entire set of plaintiffs to have standing, and um, so I think that that we will win that on that in that way. It's a, it's a but I don't think that it's it's a kind of a pyrrhic victory. And it's it's a, it's a victory that essentially says um, the First Amendment is gutted. In this case, you have this inju- injunction, but in the uh, but but like more broadly after after this case is done, that like you can find other ways. Essentially, to, when when the government um, censors. You know, it can do it with impunity, with no one, no one uh, who outstanding to sue. It'll become unenforceable. Hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, just, let me let me put it this way: Look, let, let's say you're, uh, let's say you uh, you you have President uh, Kamala Harris in uh, in in 2025, or President Trump in 2025, and he or she decides that they want to censor. Well, what they'll do is they'll tell their the, the the social media companies, you know, censor these people saying these things, and uh, don't don't. But actually, what they'll do is they won't say. Let's like, take it back. What they'll do is censor people uh, people who are saying these things without naming the people. And even with the injunction in place, no one will have standing to sue about it. Mm. So they can just it's they can just if they have a scofflaw administration bent on censoring speech they can use this loophole in the free speech in the First Amendment to censor in the future. I, I mean it's it's to me the key thing is not the whether we win the case the key thing is the principle should there be and the first should the should the First Amendment be enforceable should that should the, the administration be allowed to get away with se- telling social media companies to censor ideas of legal speech or not. Um, that's why I think at this point, given the cowardice of the Supreme Court to not rule on that to, and put in place this, this this sort of very, very restrictive standing requirement, we're going to need legislation. We're going to need Congress to act to restore free speech in the United States. So moving forward uh, for people who want to follow this closer. So you're going to do a podcast with Aaron, um, uh, which I think will be fantastic. And in terms of what's going to happen next, so it's going to move down to the lower courts for an appeal. Do you know any timeline for that? Uh, well, it's not even an appeal, right? So we're it's still we're going to actually get the case heard. This was all of this fight was over a preliminary injunction, 
right? So we'll we'll, we'll actually get the case heard in by the by the lower court in Louisiana. Okay. Um, uh, over the next, I'm not sure exactly what the timeline is. Uh, I think it's later this year we'll start to have that. We're already um, there are already like actions mo- to 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 on, on that with uh, in the last couple of weeks with uh, with um, with uh, uh, RFK Jr. It'll be it'll be it'll be uh, it'll be a long protracted case actually. Um, so, we're going so, to get more discovery, so we'll be able to read more emails because we'll, we're going to go to the court and say, "Look, some court has said that we need to find emails that that that, that establish this kind of high standard of standing. Um, we need to go read the more emails of the government to see that they did did or didn't do that, um, and to establish standing. And so we're going to get more discovery. It's going to take a, a, a while for us to do this, but I do think that uh, in the immediate term, the most hopeful thing is that the um, the attachment of RFK Jr. to the case means that the, the lower court can very quickly find that we do have standing. Yeah. And then reestablish the preliminary injunction. And then the Biden administration, or I guess, yeah, the Biden administration is going to have to decide, is it going to uh, appeal that again? But we'll, right. again, this is projecting forward. I, I, we'll see. It's hard to predict what courts will do. Yeah. So, oh, so the Supreme Court decision, that was only for the preliminary injunction? Yes. And so the final the final hearing on the case is going to be in the Louisiana court. Yes. Okay. Well, it may not be final. I mean, depending on what what happens in the Louisiana court, it's likely that the uh, if it's the Biden administration or the Harris administration, they'll that they'll appeal the case again, mm. the ruling again. I mean, of course, that's if we win. Hi, everyone. A quick word from our first and exciting sponsor, Alchemy Elements. Alchemy Elements is a powerful adaptogenic supplement. For those of you who don't know, adaptogens are a class of plant compounds, uh, primarily herbs and mushrooms, which can help build the mind and body's resistance to stress. Alchemy Elements contains a very unique and carefully selected blend of nine adaptogens, such as lion's mane, cordyceps, polygalaroot, and shilajit, and they can help boost energy, uh, boost your uh, immunity and uh, uh, increase focus uh, and overall stabilize your mood. It can have a, a wide array of effects, which can often depend from individual to individual. Um, but it's a great way to start your morning uh, and generally increase your focus and your energy levels. Uh, you can just pour one scoop of Alchemy Elements into your morning coffee or your uh, protein shake or smoothie, and you're off to the races. It's, it's a great way to start the day. I use it every day. Uh, I find that it can generally uh, stabilize my mood levels and increase focus, if, especially if I want to get a big project done or finish a, a very important task. Alchemy Elements often is a great way to, to kind of start and get my focus going and get me primed for whatever task uh, I want to accomplish. Um, we're very excited and very happy to work with Alchemy Elements. Uh, we've been working with them for a couple of months. And now in this new iteration of the podcast, we're going to continue um, our relationship, um, which is very special to us because Alchemy aligns with our mission and values of individuals taking greater ownership of their uh, personal mental and physical health and relying less and less on corrupt and flawed uh, generalized kind of medical advice uh, and, and less and less reliance on pharmaceutical drugs and more and more of, uh, of a general interest and focus on holistic health. Um, for a limited time, Illusion of Consensus readers and listeners can get 10% off their first order using the code word Illusion or 30% off a subscription uh, monthly order um, where you can get a monthly shipment of Alchemy, uh, Alchemy Elements uh, delivered to you. Um, for the subscription orders, you can also get uh, with it a, a bonus a gold kit to store your Alchemy Elements. Um, overall, I think uh, Alchemy is a fantastic product. I highly recommend you check them out uh, in the link below in uh, this podcast, wherever you're listening, Spotify, Apple, Substack, Rumble, or YouTube. Just go to the link, use the code word illusion, and you can get your discount and you won't regret it. Right. Okay. Interesting. Well. Uh, best of luck for that. And I, you know, I feel like, uh, this podcast is the perfect place in our sub stack to keep people up to date. Uh, Aaron's also doing that uh, with his platforms. So we'll make sure to, uh, continue to cover this case, uh, in podcast and article format. Um, so I'm, I'm glad I'm very grateful for, uh, this community and audience to be able to uh, do that. I think, uh, it's, it's very important to communicate in real time about these very, uh, complex topics. Yeah, I mean the reader questions are so fantastic. It's very, very clear that people are following along closely. So it, it is a complicated set of facts. Um, 
And uh, but I think it's such a vital issue. It's uh, the reason why it's so vital is because every person's First Amendment is free speech rights depends on it. Like even people who haven't been like had their posts censored. Yeah. Um, if you live in an environment where the government can censor, um, I mean, in what sense is that a lib- liberal uh, li- uh, a liberal republic? It's, I mean, it's just not. Yeah, that's right. All right, uh, wanted to spend a couple minutes on this. So uh, the Joe Rogan podcast, uh, Eric Weinstein was on with uh, Terrence Howard to do a deep dive uh, on uh, quantum mechanics and alternate universes and geometry and complex mathematics, just a bunch of stuff that totally flew past my head. I don't know if that was the same for you, Jay, but uh, it was super fascinating, even though I understood none of it. Um, a very interesting debate. Uh, but in the conversation, they were talking about uh, institutional trust and how more and more people are distrustful uh, of elite institutions and quote unquote experts. And Eric mentioned COVID, COVID pandemic. And uh, he was telling uh, Rogan, and we're going to play this clip uh, in a second for listeners and uh, uh, watchers of this podcast. Uh, he was saying that, like, you know, podcasts like Joe Rogan's, I mean, he's the perfect example, is one of the last few bastions of true, real, long-form discussion without any censorship or restriction or constraints. I mean, that really doesn't happen as much, I mean, really at all, you know, in a long-form way on CNN or Fox or any of the major platforms. And unfortunately, elite uh, media institutions like the New York Times um, have also not done a good job of giving voice to alternate sides of the debate on topics like vaccine mandates, vaccine side effects and lockdowns. So Eric said, you know, like, would you have on Jay Jay Bhattacharya and Fauci for a debate? And uh, let's play this clip now that will get you to uh, react to it. In the case of Anthony Fauci and Jay Bhattacharya, I was just with Jay Bhattacharya in Italy. You have this guy who has a PhD in economics and he's a doctor and he's a professor And he becomes a fringe epidemiologist overnight because some bureaucrat who is probably in control of the bioweapons portfolio, you know, because we signed these two treaties during the 1970s, uh, the Geneva Convention and the Bioweapons Convention. Uh, He and, uh, and Francis Collins suddenly convert a respected colleague into a fringe epidemiologist. It's like, no, we're gonna have a mutiny. And the mutiny is going to be based here because this is a place that you'd invite Tony Fauci and Jay Bhattacharya. Oh, for sure. Yeah. We can do any of that. Jay, uh, what do you think? Uh, first of all, it's always flattering to be mentioned on Joe Rogan's show. Uh, and, and, and it's also especially flattering because I'm, I'm, I'm friends with Eric Weinstein. I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for him. Um, he, uh, you know, he's a very, very uh, interesting man because he has a, like a theory of, of, uh, of physics – uh, that advances on Einstein, but it, that clashes with the sort of the the dominant string theory kind of kind of approaches that, uh, and it's um, it's it's been interesting to get to know him because the resistance of the scientific community to engage with him has been a tremendous source of frustration for him. Um, and uh, in fact, I kind of would like to have him on uh, on our show and just to, just to get uh, some some sense of what that's what that's been like. Uh, so hopefully we can we can have an episode like that in the future. Um, now Eric uh uh when he brought me up uh it was it was he, he brought me up in the context of wanting uh Tony Fauci to debate with me. You know cuz it's funny cuz the the uh the way that Tony Fauci has dealt with critics effective of, of throughout his career uh, as uh, as scientific critics it has been to absolutely demolish them destroy their destroy their reputations. Um this goes back to even the HIV days. He went after uh, Kerry Mullis, who the inventor of the PCR test, a, a Nobel Prize winning uh, biologist, uh, and Peter Duisberg, who had this theory in the 80s that uh, HIV wasn't the ca- cause of AIDS. Now, in that case, Fauci turned out to be right, but he did more than just uh, refute them. He absolutely demolished it. You know, Kerry Mullis basically left science for a long time. Um, uh, Duisburg never got another NIH grant is, was, is still like a pariah in the scientific community. He, Tony Fauci used absolutely every lever of power he could to, to demolish the careers of these people. And then of course, uh, during the COVID fight, um, the lockdown fight, uh, when, uh, Francis Collins, Tony Fauci's boss wrote an email to Tony Fauci, 
four days after we wrote, me, Martin Kuldorf, and Sunetra Gupta wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, uh, he, uh, the, he wrote an email to Tony, Tony Fauci, Francis Collins did, calling me uh, f- and Martin and, Kul- and Sunetra fringe epidemiologists, and then calling for devastating takedown. You know, leading to like death threats and all this other stuff. He, uh, Tony Fauci seems allergic to debate, and so yeah, I mean, I absolutely would love an opportunity to have a reasonable scientific discussion with Tony Fauci, uh, talking in, with with uh, with Joe Rogan or 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 in, any other reasonable interlocutor, sort of uh, moderating it. Uh, I'd even be willing to talk with him, you know, one on one on this podcast. I would be a lot of fun, um, but. I have to say, uh, as a prediction based on how Tony Fauci treats scientific dissent when they dis- when it disagrees with him, he uh, he acts in ways to demolish and destroy the people who disagree with him rather than engage. Um, in fact, uh, 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 Rav, I just completed a review of of, of uh, Tony Fauci's new memoir called On Call. Uh, for it's going to come out in Reason Magazine, and I think in a, in a month or two, um, where uh, I go go through his go through his career. I mean, I still it's I I mean I have to say like it was tough to write it because there's still a lot I admire about the man, especially his passionate commitment to HIV patients. Um, it, it comes through clearer in the book, uh, but the way the way he used his power as the top of the infectious disease public health establishment, um, and again billions and billions of dollars. He, he, the way he used his power essentially was to, to suppress debate and discussion, giving his money and his patronage to people that he liked, not allowing the scientific community to join in if they didn't agree with him. And uh, it, it's 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 sad to watch. It's essentially, it's an abuse of abuse of power by someone in his position. The top of scientific funding agencies should ab- use their power and authority and their money to expand the discussion of science, not to narrow it. And that's essentially what, what he did. Yeah. 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 I think that's right. Um, I, unfortunately during the COVID pandemic, there was not a lot of debate there were, everyone was kind of in their own echo chambers, very little movement. I mean, probably the best example was when Sanjay Gupta went on Joe Rogan's podcast and then Joe, who's not a scientist, <laughs> Uh, doesn't have any peer-reviewed papers, doesn't, he doesn't have a PhD, he was able to challenge him in real time and really exposed a lot of the flaws in his thinking. But other than that, I mean, there were a couple of small things here and there. There were a couple of interesting like Twitter spaces. Uh, I think Martin Kulldorff also did a debate with, uh, I think it might have been Eric Topol. Is that right? Um, yeah. Or, or, early I mean, on Mar- vaccine Mar- mandates. I had but, some debates. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had a debate with Mark Lipsitch. Uh, I had a couple of debates with Stan Verman, of, you know, the head of public health at Yale in, in 2020. Um, so I, I've had a, I had a few debates, but there were uh, I mean, as a general rule, what happened was that people would weren't willing to have these discussions. But for instance, at Stanford, we, there was never university, you know, there was never any uh, never any like COVID policy forum where the, both sides got together and said, "Here's what we think." Um, that's normally how you would resolve it. But universities seemed really loath to 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 uh, to platform any debate that involved people who were skeptical about lockdowns. And as a result, you had basically the lockdowns uh, getting implemented, schools closing, and now you have tremendous learning loss. The Swedish uh, health authorities actually did the right thing. Like they ended up without the lockdown, saving many more lives than, than, the, than the places that imposed the lockdowns. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, let's uh, hope and uh, uh, pray as, uh, as strongly and zealously as we can to see if uh, Fauci would ever debate you on uh, Rogan's podcast. I don't think it'll ever happen, but uh, all we can do is hope, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll also quickly mention, uh, Rogan mentioned me in, in a recent podcast with uh, Jimmy Dore. It was, it was a great conversation. Um, talk about Mark Cuban. Similar theme um, Rogan was just mentioning. Uh, we'll also pl- uh, play the clip here for the audience as well. Um, okay, so production team, you can insert that clip. Uh, yeah, so... You know, R- Rogan mentioning that up uh, it was, again. It, it's it's an honor, and I you know pr- appreciate him doing that. Um, but yeah, it's just yet another example of someone just so kind of captured in this Democrat billionaire New York Times reading, following the CDC and venerating Fauci kind of class of people that you know. When I had my uh, debate with him last summer, um, initially it was privately over email, organized by Joe. And then when I when he mentioned it in, in a podcast with Patrick Bed David, and then I posted it, then Mark and I had this back and forth. And 
it was, I mean, it was a really interesting dialogue, uh, which he deleted. Um, but thankfully, I serialized it on our Substack, which you can link below, um, going to just copy and pasting all of the responses back and forth. And, and I thought it was a really uh, powerful exercise in uh, just engaging with someone who, uh, somewhat understandably, but just, you know, having a very narrow mind with like, well, why can't we trust the CDC and the FDA? Like just someone essentially, like if I want to be charitable with him being like, well, why can't we drink water? Like is water not good for you? Shouldn't you take your vitamins? Shouldn't you take protein and have a healthy, like, like for him, it was equating CDC and FDA dictates as obvious, indisputable common sense. And anyone who disagrees with that is a complete conspiracy theorist who believes in Bigfoot or whatever, you know? Um, so I, I, you know, and similarly with him, he's been caught up on these debates on DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, et cetera. Um, but, but I feel like in a lot of these cases, more conversation and debate is the answer. And a lot of these people um, should engage with others that they disagree with as, as Mark did online. Um, although I, I did ask Mark to do a debate and he wasn't interested, but in any case, People like Fauci, people like Mark. Uh, one time I even invited uh, Nick, Dr. Nicholas Christakis, um, who was very critical of, of you and Martin and the Great Barrington Declaration, to have a debate. And uh, the only answers I got were, were negative. Um, and similarly, I think there were uh, efforts to do a debate with, um, I think it was Eric Topol or someone else. But anyway, I, I feel like debate is the answer and, and having more conversation, not less. Because currently, too many people are just stuck in their own preconceived echo chambers and they're not willing to look at the other side and try to understand where they're coming from. You know, it's uh, there's some irony about uh, Cuban actually, because uh, there's a couple of people arguing about this. So, so one is uh, during the pandemic in 2021, uh, I posted something in arguing essentially that we should follow the NIH's guidelines or suggestions that monoclonal antibodies were an effective treatment for for COVID during the Delta wave, and uh, especially the Delta wave hit the South very, very hard. Um, and I posted a link to the NIH's guidelines. I mean, so it wasn't, it wasn't like I was, you know, making stuff up. I was like, this, uh, there'd been randomized studies that suggested that if you gave monoclonal antibodies early enough, you could actually prevent people from dying or going to the hospital. And so it was very important. I thought that older people have access to this treatment. Um, and Cuban would attack me. For reasons I still don't understand, like he went after me, essentially saying we shouldn't be taking care of old people who get the who get the disease for some reason. Mainly because, and as best I could tell, it was just politically motivated. Because shortly after he attacked me, the Biden administration cut the supply of monoclonal antibodies to the South, essentially saying that that the South didn't deserve it. That that they needed to preserve the monoclonal antibodies for the North when the the disease hit later that year in the North. Wow. Um, it was purely political, uh, and I just, uh, you know, it's c- kind of disappointing. The second piece of irony about Cuban is that he runs a, a drug company, a, a drug company actually that I like, a company that that's aimed at taking uh, taking medicines, at like uh, like you know, sort of making generic medicines, uh, lowering the price of drugs for consumers. Um, I mean, in, in a sense, like he's he's uh, he sh- ought to be on the side of these kinds of discussions and debates. Instead, his political brain gets in the way of, I think, his his sort of like his his uh, his like normal uh, 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 kindness to others, his and 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 his obvious business brilliance. Um, and I don't really understand why he wants those kinds of political fights in the realm of public health, especially since he is now has now entered the public health uh, realm of public health professionally in, in his, in his like drug company that's developed. Yeah. Yeah. I just think he made some very foolish and dangerous decisions during the pandemic. I mean, he mandated uh, the Dallas Mavericks uh, NBA team to get the COVID vaccine. And, uh, you know, that's predominantly young, healthy males who are at you know, peak fitness, including staff as well. And there was no clear evidence for uh, them benefiting from the COVID vaccine, and there was good evidence of harm from vaccine myocarditis. Um, so, and and that that's was basically the heart of our debate was um, what justification or rationale is there for for mandating or or encouraging or recommending a product with no clear benefit? And his his point was just over and over again: FDA says this, this you know, Nick, Dr. Christakis or Topol or Fauci or whoever these anointed experts they're saying this, so. You know, is this not true? People are dying of COVID. 
you know, vaccines seem to be showing benefits. So, you know, what are you talking about? And I had to point out to him over and over and over again that there were other experts just as credible or sometimes more credible who were reading the studies differently and had a more accurate uh, assessment of the data when it came to vaccine efficacy and side effects and the uh, mortality of COVID. Um, so uh, if, if Mark ever wants a debate or a discussion, I'd be happy to uh, be happy to do it uh, on this podcast or any podcast he wants. Um, uh, I'm, I'm always game for that. Um, so uh, uh, we'll see if uh, he ever wants to do that. All right. Uh, next in the agenda, a uh, couple more things left. Uh, BC, uh, British Columbia, where I live, I'm here in Vancouver. Uh, BC just ended uh, the public health emergency. Finally, uh, four and a half years after the public health emergency was declared, we're in July of 2024. And <laughs> it's now officially the emergency was over. So a week ago, the emergency was still on. So in June and May and, and, and April and February, it was still an emergency that we all should have been panicking about or worried about and taking all the measures that no one was really taking, um, seemed to be. And now it's officially over. I mean, is that not just ridiculous, Jay? <laughs> I mean, uh, if you thought that the declaration of emergency, the timing of the declaration, the length of it, uh, and so on was based on scientific data, the BC uh, incredibly delayed rescission of the of of the state of emergency should convince you otherwise. Science had nothing to do with the uh, the, the the timing of the declaration of emergency uh, uh, or, or rescission of the declaration of emergency, right? It's it's essentially um, it was a political move, right? Uh, and and I think uh, in BC, if I'm understanding, there's going to be like an election coming up very soon. Um, and the conservatives who are on the outside have been pressuring the uh, the ruling NDP that that uh, over, over exactly this issue, um, and uh, and so it just it just reeks of political machinations rather than anything scientific. Um, uh, the other thing about this is that there were a lot of of healthcare workers in BC who were fired because of the vaccine mandates that were only allowed because of the emergency. If I understand correctly, they yeah. still haven't been brought 1800, back. Eighteen hundred eighteen hundred healthcare workers lost their jobs because of vaccine mandates. And, you know, it's, it's not as if there aren't, uh, you know, like you, it, one of, I mean, while the Canadian healthcare system has a lot of strains to it, it's still, uh, it can't, like running short on healthcare workers is a major problem. It, it makes it so that you get delayed care, you can't get essential services provided. Uh, and here you just had this irrational move to fire healthcare workers for a vaccine does, that doesn't stop people from getting or spreading COVID. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, it's it makes the British uh, Colombian uh, public health uh, folks just look like they don't know what they're doing, and it's just very sad to watch. Yeah, thankfully the, the vaccine requirement is now removed. Although you still have to report your vaccination status, uh, and that seems to be because in case there's a future public health emergency and there's new waves of COVID that COVID that they deem deadly or t- too dangerous, then some people are suggesting that they might bring it back. Um, but at, at least they've removed the uh, uh, the mandate now for the COVID vaccine, which is good news. But it, it definitely yeah. came way too late. It's way too late. I mean, I think um, I, I argued that the state of emergency should have been lifted in in, in uh, sometime in 2021. Uh, and the, my reasoning was wasn't had nothing to do with like the, the specifics of like are there waves of COVID? Of course there are. There'll be waves of COVID forever. My my reasoning had to do with the the kinds of powers that the government had. Because there was a state of emergency, uh, were, were were excessive, and the fact they were using those powers to harm that in ways that harm people, closing schools, for instance, well into tw- into twenty twenty one, for instance, um, uh, the 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 beginning and end of pandemics are are only partly scientific decisions. They're actually often largely political decisions, especially the end of a pandemic. Um, and uh, so the de- and the and so the the question isn't is does the science support starting or ending a, a, a declaration, an emergency declaration. The question is, what are the powers that the emergency declaration are going to give to the government, and will those powers be used for the good of the people or not? And uh, uh, I think, um, you know, you, uh, we, we can argue about 2020, but I think into 2021 and 2022, a lot of those powers were not used for good. And certainly into 2024, I'm really glad to see the end of the state of emergency in BC. It should have come much earlier. Yeah, for sure. All right, we have a couple things left to discuss. Uh, really, the the big uh, main topic left: uh, the Hope Accords. 
Um, so do you just want to take a couple minutes and talk about uh, your debate slash uh, discussion with Joseph Freeman, which is on our podcast, and, and I highly recommend people uh, check that out. Um, you, uh, towards the start, were more on the side of not signing the Hope Accords, uh, but towards the end, you were convinced and you signed it. So can you just explain your uh, the trajectory of your thought process on that? Sure. Uh, so uh, actually folks should definitely listen to that discussion between me. Joe and I are good friends. So it's, uh, you know, it's really fun to debate or discuss with people uh, disagreements over points where you, where you're, where you're friends that um, uh, the, the, the Joe uh, is one and Clara Craig and some others wrote something called the hope accords. Um, it's, it basically has a few planks. The most important, uh, the, the, uh, I think the most important of which, which I wholeheartedly agree with is the reestablishment of ethics in public health. Um, but it also has a plank, which I, I, I initially was hesitant to sign on to, to say that nobody should be permitted to get the COVID vaccine anymore going forward. Um, and the reason I was hesitant to sign was that I, I think I, and you can see this in the discussion that I had with Joe in our podcast, I, I think that it's possible that there may be groups of patients who might benefit from it immunocompromised patients, I'm not sure exactly who, but there may be some. And if, if you rescind the ability to give it, then it's possible that you're hurting those patients. That was the argument I was making with Joe. And Joe pointed out something that I think is really important, and this really changed my thinking on this. Um, the way that you would learn about that, whether there are groups of patients that benefit, is by running randomized trials. And uh, I mean, that's, you know, you identify groups of patients you think would benefit, you run a randomized trial specific for that group and see, is it benefiting that group of patients more than it's harming them? Um, he pointed out, Joe pointed out that as long as this, uh, as this, this approval made, is maintained, the companies, Pfizer, Moderna, and so on, um, have absolutely no incentive to run such a trial. Because they can just recommend recommend those folks that everybody get it, and in fact, the recommendation in the United States is still still the kids as young as I think six months should get the COVID vaccine, um, and it's it's kind of a farce, right? Most parents aren't giving their kids the vaccine anymore or the, the boosters anymore. Um, the uptake for the vaccines, despite like tremendous propaganda in, in favor, is like twenty thirty percent of the American population are taking the you know the nth dose of it. Um, and so uh, the continued approval of it actually makes it less likely that you would get the kind of studies that I really want to see, which is let's, if you want to use the vaccine for, uh, for vulnerable people, let's do a randomized study to prove that it's useful for those, for those however, whichever groups you think are most vulnerable and put the onus on the, the, um, uh, the drug companies that that make made billions and billions of dollars off it to run those studies that they should have been running all along. Yeah. So uh, through the discussion, you were eventually convinced to sign off on uh, the, the particular idea that, or the the proposition that no one should be getting the COVID vaccines anymore, including elderly uh, well, or vulnerable the, the prop- population. So the, the proposition wasn't that. The proposition, the proposition, the hope accord is that the, that the the approval of the COVID vaccine should be rescinded. Um, right. so it's, it, yeah, so that's what I signed on to. I, I, I don't, I, I still don't know if there should or shouldn't be some groups that should get it. Uh, there might be, it's just that the, the, by, if, if the approval is rescinded, then we're more likely to get the studies that would identify, uh, and test whether there are groups of people and, and it'll put the onus on the drug companies to prove it rather than, uh, what, what the drug companies have now, which is carte blanche to say, in a, inaccurately that most of the population should get it or all, all of the po- basically effectively all of the population should get it and it's good for the population to all, all get it when we don't know that for right. a fact and if, if i want to play uh peter hotez devil's advocate here for a second uh someone like that might say well if you rescind the approval of the covid vaccines and wait for those studies to happen for the next you know whatever six months to a year it might take to run that study could there not be people suffering or who will suffer from not being able to get the COVID vaccine if the if the approval is rescinded, particularly vulnerable or elderly people? I actually don't think it would take that long to run such studies. I mean, COVID waves are coming and going all the time. Um, and uh, if the, 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 the set of people that are vulnerable, I mean, the hypothesis might be immunocompromised people are vulnerable. Most of them have had several, you know, the vaccines and several boosters, right? So the, the, those boosters, I mean, if, they, if the hypothesis is that they worked, 
um, that then like, you know, sort of waiting a, a, a three, four, five months or whatever to run a, a study, a real randomized study for those subgroups um, shouldn't be that uh, a, it's too much of a burden. And, 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 and the, and the thing I guess I'd counter with, uh, with someone making that point is how do you know it's going to be good for them until you have such a study? Like we're not talking about the original two doses now. We're talking about a very, very different variant, uh, a, a vaccine that's been updated several several times. Yeah, what are we on, like dose six or something? I don't even know anymore. What yeah, I've lost track of the dose. Yeah. So, I mean, the point is that like you have to like make uh, the case in the current environment that it's worthwhile. And uh, right. the 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 uh, um, and the onus is on the on the drug companies right. to do that, right? It's what, why um, should we so get th- this thing? Not why should we not? It's why should yeah, we inject exactly. This thing? Yeah, and you know, I think um, there is such a a principle in the, in the United States. There's law that says that you can have the right to try, right? So you, if there's non-approved drugs that people that your doctor thinks uh, should that that you know, for compassionate use, you should be able to allow to have, even though it's not yet approved. Um, they can still have, you can still do that, right? So if, if like someone's convinced, they can convince the doctor that you have the right to try. There's legislation that allows you to do that. I think, I think that, that the harm to the people who think that the vaccines are absolutely, you know, dose N of the vaccine is necessary for their health and well being, um, is, is low. And I think the main thing is the benefit is not proven for dose yeah. N of the vaccine. Uh, I, I think personally, just looking at the totality of the data, again, again, there may be some subgroups, but the vast, vast majority of the population has already had COVID and recovered, had the vaccine um, before. Uh, and so the marginal benefit for the vaccine for the, mo- the most of the people in the population, the vast majority of people in the population is pretty close to zero of mm. the nth dose. And, uh, and of course there are still the side effects to worry about. So I, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, after, after that debate with Joe, I went home and thought some more about it and I, and I thought he was absolutely right. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's actually fun to lose a debate by the way. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if you know this, like, cause you, you change your mind about something and you, and you like come to become more right. So it's really, it's a debate is one of those things or discussions like these are, are one of those things where like, I think, um, People think that it's a bad thing to lose, but in fact, you learn when you lose. Yeah. And I, th- I mean, I'm, I'm really pleased that Joe had that, that that civil discussion with me, and I'm really pleased to have come to agree with him. Yeah, yeah, that's a very uh, mature, uh, enlightened perspective. Because for most people, losing that's their 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 ego hurts. Like I'm wrong, I'm bad, right? I messed up, and my thinking was incorrect. Like no one wants to admit that, right? We saw that during the COVID pandemic with some of the most powerful prominent people, right? I mean, it, it really just comes down to ego, right? Joe Rogan actually does a really good job of talking about this, how he says he divorces his, himself from his ideas. He's like, as soon as you marry yourself to your ideas, then, you know, then if you're proven wrong or someone shows you something different from what you said, then it's just wrapped up in your identity. But you got to detach your who you are and what your worth is and who you are just as a human being to your ideas. And that way you can lose debates, win debates. It's just you are still you. Uh, I mean, this, uh, I, that's a very scientific kind of approach to things, right? So if in science, you're going to be wrong. I mean, it's just, if you're, a, if you're a, at, at all a competent scientist, you're going to have ideas that, uh, that the experiment doesn't agree with. What do you do? You like stick to those ideas, even though the experiment doesn't agree with it? The arguments are good. Of course not. You adopt the new idea that, that, that the experiment leads you to, right? The data drive you to where you sh- should be. It's not a virtue to stick to ideas that are wrong, <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, now, at the same time, you want to fully explore them. That's what debate and discussion are about, right? Is to is to like actually fully explore them and then see, um, you know, pl- play devil's advocate even with yourself. Um, the the process, the the purpose is to is to become more right to like understand the world better. The process isn't to establish yourself as as you know the the smartest person on the face of the earth. Even Einstein was wrong multiple times in his life and career. All right, uh, we have. Two uh, listener questions uh, for this podcast. I put out a call out um, for our conversation. Uh, one by Ann Forty, who works with React Nineteen, a charity for the COVID vaccine. Uh, might be interviewing a couple people from there, or uh, Jay. Uh, we might do together potentially. We'll talk about that afterwards. Um, oh, I know, I know, Ann. She's on Twitter. I, I, she's yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. She's yeah, very, very nice. Bright, yeah. Yeah. yeah, very informative. Yeah, so she sent a, a very long comment that uh, had a lot of insight and interesting things. Uh, I worked with React 19, and I'm constant. I'm, I'm in constant communication with the COVID vaccine injured. Um, uh, a lot of people they've lost their health, they've lost their jobs, 
Uh, many have used up their entire life savings in an attempt to get well. Some have filed bankruptcy. Many injured have lost hope and at times their will to live. Uh, they no longer want to be a burden on their family. So sometimes that uh, uh, they're even looking to move to states for assisted suicide. My question is this. In all of the interactions you have within the medical, legal, political arenas, is there any indication that people are willing to truly address the issues that have happened to the vaccine injured, not only in regard to censorship, but also to get them actual research and treatment to help them? Do people understand the suffering and despair that is occurring every day? Or is it, as Bree Dressen stated in her recent interview with Patrick Bed David, that these institutions want nothing more for us to go away and die quietly? <sighs> That's a powerful I, I question. I wish I could bring... I yeah. mean, that's a power, powerfully put, um, and I wish I could bring good news, but I, I'd have to say I, I, I can't. Um, the censorship, of course, we talked about. It, this actually, it was explicitly aimed at the vaccine injured. That, they were the public enemy number one in 2021 for the Biden administration. Um, and uh, the, 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 the vaccine injury funds are tiny, tiny, tiny in comparison to the sort of harms that were done to some of the vaccine injured folks. Uh, and the level of scientific interest, it's not that there's no scientific interest in understanding how to help people recover. Um, you know, I, I've heard the similar things from, from from some of the folks in the long COVID community, right? They're just, it's, it's um, and, but the long COVID community, there is actually some scientific interest and some advances that are being made, but the, the vaccine injured community, uh, the, less so. Uh, and it just, it's just wrong. It's wrong to uh, essentially uh, uh, treat these people who got the vaccine? They did. They did what the what the public health authorities wanted them to do. Got legitimately injured, and then pretend like they're, they're that they that they don't exist. And uh, I, I mean, my heart goes out to them. And uh, I'd say um, to the folks that are suffering through it, um, you know, hang in there. There's going to be uh, there's going to come come uh, more research. There's going to come a time when people will see you, and you are your bravery in st- going through this will be a blessing to others. So. Uh, hang in there. The, the, I think uh, I, you know. I'm going to, of course, be advocating for that. That uh, their their well being. Be, uh, that the scientific community move forward in it. It hasn't yet, but it will. Yeah, just lost you for a second. You, you blanked out for a second. Yeah. Uh, all right. The, the pr- production team will fix that. Um, yeah. So the as, as far as treatments goes, I mean, really, the most promising thing I've seen is for stem cell therapy. And I had Dr. Adil Khan on the podcast talk about his clinical experience that was very compelling and he's interested in running studies and they're going to set up a charity fund at Eterna Health, uh, his stem cell therapy clinic, um, and potentially work with React 19. I'm going to make sure to put those guys in touch. I know Anne and I have chatted a little bit. I've chatted with uh, Adil um, with the remarkable success he's seen with treating vaccine injured patients with um, the stem cell therapy targeted at the uh, immune system and nervous system. Um, they're interested in running more studies to really uh, scientifically prove that these things work in a randomized controlled uh, tr- randomized controlled trial uh, trials. And um, I, I, I have a feeling that that's going to be the future for um, uh, uh, fixing those issues. And I hope um, with those studies and more and more interest in that area um, that those people that are really struggling, um, including people struggling with things like paralysis um, from the vaccine, will. Uh, get some relief. Um, I, I do have some hope. Um, it'll take some work behind the scenes, uh, and I'm going to try and and connect the right people together. And um, uh, I know I, I talked to Dr. Adil Khan. Um, there might be some room to, to make some efforts towards uh, just generating more funds and some charitable donations to uh, uh, give people a greater access to what are very expensive uh, potential treatments for um, uh, vaccine injuries. So um, I'm going to try and do what I can behind the scenes to raise awareness. And uh, I'm sure I'll talk to Anne at some point and we'll definitely cross pollinate with uh, React 19 and uh, feature their work and uh, probably do a podcast uh, at some point soon with them. So uh, Anne, um, definitely uh, stay tuned. Uh, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll do more um, on this particular topic. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not quite ready to sign off on any particular treatment yet uh, until until there's like really great evidence. Um, exactly, uh, and you know, I, I want randomized trials and stuff. But uh, yep. like I said, I do have some hope, and I'm glad to see that there's been some movement to try to t- test new ideas. Um, yep. I mean, the folks that have been injured for the vaccines, the long COVID community, they they definitely need 
but they ne- they definitely need new ideas. I'm mean, glad to see it starting to develop. Yeah. Yeah. With long COVID, I'm going to be doing a couple podcasts, uh, by the way, Jay. I don't know if we've talked about this offline, but um, for me, I th- think I tweeted about this at some point. I've struggled a lot in the past with psychosomatic issues, uh, digestive issues, seemingly cardiac related issues, chronic pain issues. And only over the past couple of years, realizing that the cause was fear and anxiety and really high stress levels. And there's uh, some emerging research and clinical uh, practice from the likes of Dr. Howard Schubiner and Alan Gordon, really the, the pioneers or prominent doctors in the mind-body space who um, are showing and uh, hypothesizing that um, long COVID in, in many cases, maybe even most or vast, vast majority are psychosomatic um, or the individuals with struggling with trauma, fear, anxiety, very high cortisol levels, nervous system dysregulation. And so the, the, the treatment is more psychological rather than physiological. Um, so I, I'm going to be doing some podcasts on that. Well, I mean, it's, it's always, these things are very complicated, right? So you can have a physical, physical element that then leads you to psychological, uh, terror over the, the physical element and it plays back and forth. So it's, it, I'm, I mean, I'm, I just, my heart goes out to anyone in that situation. Um, so we'll, hopefully, yeah. hopefully we can start to get uh, better treatments as, as, as we go forward. Yeah. Uh, one more question from uh, Brenda. Uh, um, she says, uh, it's also a longer comment. Uh, people who don't trust the vaccines are safe, especially the mRNA platform are being labeled as anti-vaxxers. Uh, she's mentioning Peter Hotez falsely claiming that the anti-vaccine aggression claimed 200,000 American lives. He is selling the idea that Homeland Security and NATO forces should be involved to counter this aggression. Um, I've never seen such blatant 1984 style propaganda as this. Uh, these vaccines have not been proven to be safe. Um, uh, he is gaslighting us with these statements. The fact that Hotez profits from vaccines is never mentioned in his interviews. He's advocating for medical tyranny. Uh, how can we wake up the hypnotized so that we don't walk into a dystopian movie? Uh, the worst part of this is the already injured who are basically being tortured by being ignored. We need humanity back in the human race. I mean, uh, it's. I did see that clip uh, that fr- that Peter Hotez had, uh, and actually, maybe uh, Rob, can you put the the production team can maybe put the the clip of Peter Hotez doing that here? Um, sure. Yeah. So I I did see that clip of Peter Hotez before, uh, where he's talking about countering uh, vaccine aggression. And uh, and science anti science aggression anti vaccine aggression anti science aggression. It's interesting he uses the word aggression. Essentially, a lot of people uh, on the COVID vaccine feel like they were lied to. They were lied to about whether the vaccine would stop you from getting COVID. That's very very clear that 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 public health authorities absolutely blew it on that right they they asserted essentially without good evidence that the covid vaccine would stop you from getting covid permanently in effect and it doesn't right it, the the the, way, the vaccine wanes in eff, waned in efficacy after only a few months of getting it so that a very large fraction of the vaccine vaccinated population also got covid uh never despite the vaccine and they felt people felt lied to um and uh they, they were lied to that there were no people who were vaccine injured and of course there are um, and so legitimate questions by the public about the COVID vaccine are not, is not anti-vaccine aggression. Those are just legitimate questions. And when people feel lied to, they'll wonder whether the people that were, that lied to them were lying to them about other things, including other vaccines. Now, I, I, I think that, that there's good evidence for, for many, many of the vaccines that are used. Uh, but I understand why a lot of the population doesn't agree with me on this now. And the right response to that is is engagement with people about this, honest engagement with people about about these issues that where they where they th- they have legitimate questions, not let's sick NATO on them. <laughs> uh, I mean, essentially, I can I cannot think of a way of creating more resistance to public health, more collapse in the trust in public health than what Peter Hotez is suggesting. Um, we need to be in public health much more humble in the way that we deal with the public. We need to be more honest in the way we deal with the public. We serve the public. They don't serve us. And uh, we don't need to call out NATO just because 
the public doesn't agree with us about something. It's just, it's ridiculous. I have to say, I have, um, I guess I'm not too worried about it because if you, anyone with an open mind listening to uh, Peter Otez talk this way can see that that's not a reasonable thing to say. It's just not, yeah. it's, I think even people in public health, most people in public health don't think that way that he thinks. And uh, it shocks me that someone who's had such prominence in public health would would talk and act in a way that uh, that's just, just self discrediting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What he said was just completely outrageous. I mean, to evoke this kind of militaristic, like heavy fist response to people who disagree with you for good or for bad reason. I mean, that's not that's just going to pull people further apart. It's just going to lead people to resist more, like you said, and not actually view you with any kind of credibility like it's just going to make people more and more divided more and more angry more and more bitter and if you know if if rhetoric like that keeps on getting perpetuated and promoted on mainstream platforms then you're just going to have more and more people that aren't going to trust anything and trust in institutions is at an all-time low already um so if, if public health wants to win credibility back i mean cdc fda major uh institutions, magazines, uh, journals, they really got to change their approach to things and deal with information with a lot more humility, honesty, and transparency, I think. 100%. Uh, lastly, before we sign off, um, I just just want to uh, end off by saying like, I'm very grateful for uh, the Illusion of Consensus community. Um, uh, I, I, you know, like, like we already said, in June, I was away for a little while. You were also doing talks, and you also spent a week with family. Um, but upon returning, I'm just just so grateful to have this existing robust community, and uh, I'm excited to uh, you know now post more and more frequently now that uh, I'm, I'm back working and uh, recording podcasts and hopefully doing some articles soon as well. Um, I'm just super excited to uh, release more content, and for me personally, um, uh, I'll just say that you know, as, as many people have noticed already, I'm more and more interested in ways for people to improve their health, whether, you know, sleep, mental health, you know, dep- depression, addiction, anxiety. I'm going to be doing a lot of podcasts on those topics uh, more and more, especially like mental and physical health. I've already done a couple on sleep. I have another one on sleep planned. It's just getting so many questions. A lot, a lot of people are interested, um, but that's kind of the trail that I'm following uh, and I'm, and I'm just loving it. And I'm, I'm enjoying interviewing people who are presenting alternate ways of uh, helping people take ownership of their health and improve their mental and physical health without using oftentimes pharmaceutical medications like SSRIs that haven't shown to be very effective and have side effects. So that's kind of the direction that I'm going in. um, And I'm very happy and just grateful that uh, we have an audience that uh, will listen. Um, Is there anything, Jay, that you want to say in terms of future uh, thoughts or things that are in the works or this direction that you'd want to go in with uh, the podcast? Well, I think uh, I still have quite a bit, bit of unfinished business with the COVID pandemic. Uh, so I'm not yep. quite ready to let that go. Um, I think the, um, the, the, uh, the opportunity to reach this audience has been a, just an absolute thrill for me. Uh, it's, it's allowed me to speak to the public in ways that I didn't have before. Uh, and, uh, I, I'm still, I'm still quite passionate about these free speech issues. Those are not resolved. Um, yeah. in fact, I think we're, as I said, we talked about earlier, quite, quite, quite in danger. I, I'm still, as I said, very interested in making sure that we learn the right lessons from the COVID pandemic. The, the, I thought the COVID response was the worst public health, peacetime public health disaster in history. Um, and, uh, I, I want to make sure that public health systems are reformed, uh, so that those kinds of mistakes don't happen again. And then the, the other ideas that I'm really interested in now have to do with the prevention of dangerous biological research that I think likely caused the pandemic. And so I want to keep highlighting that debate, uh, and so that, the, so that some of the voices that are prominent in that debate who have not come to the attention of the public can get heard, uh, some, and, uh, and so that we can, can get, uh, good, uh, good regulation of those kinds of activities so that the public, public has a voice when scientists want to conduct dangerous experiments. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're d- definitely not done with COVID. And I, th- I think it's great that you and I are kind of doing kind of working on different sides of the same kind of spectrum. I'm I'm kind of interested in, in ways for people to improve their life and different things that they can do, breaking from the consensus on mental health, physical health, sleep, etc. And then I think you're doing a very powerful and important job in 
finishing the business with COVID and highlighting, you know, many of the problems and covering the free speech issues, which are so critical. I think it's a very healthy mix of, of content. So um, uh, I, I appreciate having you as a partner. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's great. It's great to have this kind of balance of uh, information and content. Yeah, likewise, Rav. It's been really fun to work with you yeah. and conti- I'm really looking forward to continuing yeah. to do so. And just so the audience knows, uh, we'll definitely um, get a Q&A scheduled. We haven't done one in a while. Obviously, like I said, we've been away. But a live Q&A is, is definitely in order. Uh, it's been a few months since we've done one. And we'll probably definitely do a couple of them uh, uh, in a relatively smaller window to kind of make up for uh, the last month. But it'll be great to do a live Q&A. And obviously, uh, paid members uh, sending in their questions. That's awesome. Uh, I have a couple episodes lined up uh, on sleep and mental health where we've gotten listener questions uh, the podcast with Aaron that you're doing, uh, you got some listener questions. So, uh, keep those coming. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, everyone, thanks so much, uh, for listening, uh, Jay, uh, appreciate it. And, uh, we'll definitely record more of these, uh, very soon. Hi everyone. All right. Has the dust settled from the COVID policy response? Far from it. The storms are many. Inflation, learning losses, ill health, high crime, broken government services, displaced workers, substance abuse, mass loneliness, discredited science, real estate crisis, censorship, and overweening state power. The world is on fire with war, mass killings, crime, hunger, revolution. The lack of accountability, or even so much as an apology, is a foreshadowing. They'll keep their newfound powers and try it all again. Brownstone Institute is seeking answers, undertaking important research and publishing the results while providing fellowships for dissident scholars who have been professionally displaced. It's not about this one crisis. We urgently need to restore peace, prosperity, and integrity in science and journalism. Visit brownstone.org for more. We may never get to the truth, but we can get closer to the truth. There will be no stopping the efforts. 